Hello and welcome to this Cochlear Implant Hackathon. My name is Andrew Oxenham and I'm a professor of psychology and otolaryngology at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. Uh, my job today is to give you a very brief and general introduction into hearing and into cochlear implants. So let's look first at the different roles of hearing. Uh, first of all, hearing is important for alerting and orienting us. Localization accuracy with hearing is actually about a hundred times less accurate than with vision, but it has a number of important advantages. First of all, we can't close our ears so that they remain um, ready to receive information at all times. Also, we can hear behind us, so that gives us a 360 degree um, awareness of the world. And of course, uh, we can hear in the dark. So the current thought is that we can use hearing to alert us and then we can orient based on our sense of hearing um, by moving our heads and then um, localize with more accuracy using vision. Another important role of hearing is to provide us with environmental awareness. We can tell whether we're in a crowded or empty space based on certain acoustic cues that are available to us. Uh, we can tell whether we're indoors or outdoors based on the presence or absence of reverberation. And in many different situations, we can tell whether we're in a more threatening or in a safe environment, again, based on acoustic cues. Um, perhaps most importantly, though, uh, hearing plays a role in communication both for speech and for music. Now to understand a bit more about how hearing works, let's start with the ear. Um, on the left here we have the pinna, um, which is the part of the ear we typically think of as the ear. Um, included in the outer ear is not only the pinna, but the uh, ear canal, or external auditory meatus, and the eardrum, or the tympanic membrane. This is a thin uh, film of skin, and that seals off the outer ear from the middle ear, which is an air-filled cavity that includes the middle ear bones, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. Um, their role is to transmit vibrations from the uh, eardrum to the inner ear, and in particular the cochlea, which is the hearing organ part of the inner ear that takes those vibrations, transduces them, from mechanical vibrations into electrical signals that are then passed along the auditory nerve uh, to the brain. Now, um, what we see here is the vibrations from one of the middle ear bones, the stapes, um, reaching the bony cavity, which is the cochlea. And the vibrations here at the oval window are um, equalized by um, a little um, opening here known as the round window that's also uh, covered with a thin film of skin and so any pressure applied here is equalized by a slight bulging of the uh, round window. But if we zoom now in to the cochlea to see how those vibrations are processed, um, it's probably easier to do that if we unfurl the cochlea. Imagine taking this spiral shape and just rolling it out. We would end up with something like this. You can see here the tympanic membrane is vibrating. That causes the middle ear bones to vibrate which then uh, sets up a pattern of vibration within the uh, cochlea itself. Um, the cochlea, um, and particularly the basal membrane, which runs along the length of the cochlea here, um, fulfills a very important role, and that's similar to what um, a prism does for light. You can think of this in some ways as an acoustic prism, because it takes a complex sound and breaks it up into its constituent frequency components with low frequency components being best represented at the far end or the apex of the cochlea, and high frequency components best, rem best represented at the near end or the base of the cochlea. We can see that a little more clearly in the next diagram. Um, here we have, for instance, a low frequency sound that produces um, activity in terms of vibration at the apex of the cochlea, near the apex. Medium frequencies, in this case 1,000 hertz, somewhere near the middle. High frequencies, in this case 10,000 hertz, somewhere near the base of the cochlea. And most importantly, if we have a complex sound with multiple frequencies present, um, each of those frequencies is represented at a different place along the cochlea. So the basilar membrane provides us with a frequency-to-place map extending from low frequencies at the far end to 
high frequencies at the near end or the base. Now, to understand how those patterns of vibrations are then converted into electrical signals for the brain, uh, we're going to look further into the cochlea by taking a cross-section uh, across here and zooming in to one of these turns um, as indicated by this small square here. So we're going to take a deep dive into this small square here, and that's what we see in this next figure. And we can see the basilar membrane here. We're ba basically looking in along the length of the basilar membrane. So the basilar membrane, you can imagine, extending into the screen and also out towards you from the screen. Um, lining the basilar membrane, sitting on top of it, is what's known as the organ of corti, and that includes one row of inner hair cells and three rows of outer hair cells. And it's the inner hair cells that pick up the vibrations and convert them into electrical activity or spikes that are then sent along the auditory nerve uh, to the brain. The outer hair cells, very fascinating, um, actually work to amplify sound within the cochlea mechanically and sharpen the tuning so that we can better hear out uh, different frequencies. But for actually sending that information onto the brain, we think it's the inner hair cells that are primarily responsible for that. So um, when we lose our hearing, this can uh, happen due to a loss of um, outer hair cells, um, but in particular inner hair cells, if we lose the inner hair cells completely, we no longer have any mechanism by which to send the information from the vibrations in the ear to the brain itself, and we end up with complete deafness because those vibrations are no longer converted into neural spikes. So uh, what cochlear implants do in those kind of situations is to essentially bypass the cochlea to stimulate the auditory nerve directly with electrical pulses. And in doing so, they restore some hearing function, including, for most people, some speech understanding. So we're going to take a quick look now at um, the structure and function of cochlear implants, starting off with a schematic diagram in the upper right here, we can see the implanted electrode array uh, going into the cochlea and following the cochlea around um, in one turn. And we can see an actual um, X-ray picture of that here. Um, and here's another schematic which shows the, the whole device um, with the electrode array inserted into the cochlea. Um, but the device itself that's implanted here, um, this is really just a receiver. It receives information from the... Um, basically the hearing aid, the microphone out here, and the speech processor. And the information from the speech processor is then transmitted um, via this link um, wirelessly from the outside um, of the skull to the implanted device inside. And then the electrical information from here is then sent to the individual electrodes within the, within the cochlea. So cochlear implants have gone, undergone a number of changes since their very early days of development. Um, and as far as I see it, there are two main developments that each resulted in um, pretty large improvements in performance. The first one was the transition from a single channel system where you really just had one electrode inserted into the cochlea, um, providing the ear with essentially an analog waveform of the sound on the outside. The transition from that to a multi-channel system where you had multiple electrodes with each electrode providing the ear with a certain range of frequencies, um, much in the same way as happens in an actual cochlea with the basilar membrane breaking sound up into different frequencies along its length. We now have that simulated via different electrodes with each electrode representing a range of frequencies. And that transition from single channel to multi-channel led to a great improvement particularly in speech understanding for people with cochlear implants. Another big improvement in performance came with the introduction of what's known as continuous interleaved sampling, or CIS, in the 1990s. What happened here was that the electrical signal that was sent to each electrode was delivered in short um, biphasic pulses, um, and that they were timed such that uh, the pulses from individual electrodes didn't overlap with each other and so it didn't produce direct electrical interference. And that uh, method of providing stimulation via these non-overlapping electrical pulses also led to a 
a fairly large improvement in performance um, across the board and has basically been adopted by most cochlear implant manufacturers now. That was in the early 1990s, and although many more people have received cochlear implants since then, and um, the criteria for achieving cochlear implants, or for um, being eligible for a cochlear implant, rather, um, has changed so that more people are now eligible for them, overall the performance of cochlear implants hasn't undergone any great leaps since um, the early 90s. There's just been a steady improvement overall, but um, nothing that's really um, been noticeable in terms of um, revolutionary breakthrough in technology. So to help you understand a little bit how the basic function of a cochlear implant um, is implemented, um, here's a schematic diagram showing that you have a microphone and a speech processor, which then takes the signal, transmits it um, wirelessly across the skin and the, and the skull to the receiver, which then sends the information to the electrode array. Now, in general, most cochlear implants function in this way, that the sound is then taken and split up into different bandpass filters with the high frequencies in one filter and, um, as you go down, increasingly low frequencies to the lowest here. This example only has four channels. Um, cochlear implants generally have more than that, um, somewhere between usually 12 and 22 or 24. Um, but this is just for the um, purpose of illustration here. We see that the signal is split up into four different bands going from the highest frequency to the lowest frequency. Within each band, the signal is then rectified and low-pass filtered to extract what's known as the temporal envelope. Um, that's basically the amplitude of the sound. And that amplitude is, is then used to drive the amplitude of the electrical pulses that are sent to the individual electrodes, in this case, four different electrodes, one through four. Let's see how that's implemented with an actual speech sound. What we have here is, here is the sound sa. There you can see the s, the noisy part of the s, the fric fricative, followed by the voiced vowel sound, the r. And because the fricative is mostly high frequency, the s sound, it stimulates mostly the highest frequency channel in this uh, array. Um, you can see the s represented here, and it's really not represented in the lower channels, whereas the r sound is lower in frequency, and it's represented best in the lower frequency channels, and you can see the representation here. When we extract, extract the en envelope from that, uh, we end up with um, a large signal in the high frequency channel in response to the s, and larger signals in the low frequency channels in response to the r. And those amplitude values are then used to determine what the amplitudes of the electrical pulses are that are actually sent to the cochlear implant, and that's illustrated in this bottom right panel here. Now, although cochlear implants have done a tremendous job in terms of providing uh, speech understanding to people who have lost uh, their hearing, um, there are a number of remaining challenges. Even though speech perception in quiet is on average quite good for people with cochlear implants, uh, there remains very large variability that's pretty poorly understood between patients, um, with the range of performance going all the way from 0% of words understood and recognized correctly to 100% of words recognized correctly in quiet. Music remains a big challenge for cochlear implants. The lyrics are transmitted quite well, as you'd expect, because they're based on speech. And rhythm information is also transmitted very well. Um, there is some melodic information that makes it through a cochlear implant, but in general, little or no harmony information makes it through a cochlear implant. So although People with cochlear implants can enjoy music based on rhythm and the lyrics and, in some cases, the melody. The sort of more fine-grained details of the music, in particular things like harmony, are generally lost uh, when processed via a cochlear implant. Another main challenge, possibly the most important challenge, is speech perception in noise. This is generally much poorer than for people with normal hearing, and that makes social situations, um, gatherings in bars, restaurants, etc., very challenging, and it's probably the thing that people with cochlear implants, and indeed all people with hearing loss, complain about most often. Now, in terms of understanding those challenges based on the limitations of current cochlear implants, one limitation is clearly the relatively small number of electrodes on a cochlear implant. Um, this number is typically between 12 and 24, depending on the manufacturer. And whether it's 12 or 24, 
that number is very small compared with the more than 3,000 inner hair cells that are present in the normal cochlea. Now, the trouble here is that we can't simply solve that problem by increasing the number of electrodes because the electrical fields from each electrode spread uh, to multiple auditory neurons, and that causes interference between the electrodes. And just adding more electrodes will essentially result in more interference and not um, no great improvement in actual performance. Now, these are at the moment at least considered fundamental limitations that are unlikely to be solved with current devices because it's based on the hardware and the physiological limits that are present with the current setup. Um, that doesn't mean that there's no hope for improvement because some aspects of cochlear implant processing could potentially still be improved. Um, one of those aspects involves speed, uh, signal processing and that can be used to enhance the wanted signal, such as speech for instance, and suppress any unwanted signals, uh, such as noise. Um, also, one could imagine enhancing acoustic features that are important for speech, such as voice uh, performance or voice pitch, and that could in turn help to improve intelligibility. These could be done to the front end signal that's transmitted to the cochlear implant electrodes, and so because of that, um, that makes them a potential target for this hackathon. So that's um, all I have for you uh, today in terms of a brief introduction to hearing and a brief overview of how cochlear impl implants function and what the current challenges and limitations are. Um, based on that, I wish you luck and success in achieving improvements in this very important uh, medical domain. And I look forward to um, listening to the results. Thank you.